wanted everything easy, so we were joking around. Amen. But, you know, what that message would do if you take the time to listen and hear through it, and I was talking to a few of you guys, and I'm glad that it reached what I wanted to accomplish. Because it is hard questions to ask yourself. It is hard things to look at in our lives. But, but there's liberation in finding the truth. That's why Jesus says, the truth shall make you free. Amen. Lies will only keep you in bondage. The truth will make you free. But today, I want to piggyback off that message. And I know some of us have desires and some of us have different things that from Tuesday's message, we're saying, man, I got to get this area of my life right. I want to do this for God. I want to do that for God. But here comes the application part where we're faced with the same very difficult things in our life. They don't get easier. Um, but as we're approaching them, I want to preach today about the right kind of help. A simple message tonight from the book of Psalms. And I have an illustration. When Jan Paderewski was to leave his native Poland to play his first recital in London, he asked an influential uh, co-worker of his to give him a letter of introduction to a leading fi figure in Britain's musical world who might be of assistance should anything go wrong. So he asked this guy who was a, a good musician, hey, can you help me out? They were buddies. Can you write a letter that in case my recital goes bad, I can take this letter and I can go and uh, somebody will give me a job, you know, because they'll, they'll take your word for it that I'm good. So the guy hands him this letter and he hands it to him in a sealed envelope. So what happens is as Jan goes through his recital, nothing happens. He plays and he plays great. Never needs the letter and he just goes on with his musical career. Years later, he was going through his papers and he found the letter, the letter of recommendation. And he decided to open it. And when he opened it, he was surprised at what he read. The words written on the letter said, this will introduce Jan Paderewski, who plays the piano, but he has no talent. How many know that that's the wrong kind of help? The wrong kind of help can derail us in life. And as believers, we can have very, very good intentions. We can want to do good things for God. And even Paul, one of the greatest Christians who've ever lived, said the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. And the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing even more. That is the battle of this life. But what we can do in our quest to get closer to God, to know God more, to do more things for God, is we can seek help in this fight, but we can seek it from the wrong things. We can seek it from people who are not really interested in seeing you succeed. You know, it's a tough pill to swallow, even for me as a pastor, to realize that sometimes people are going to come into this church and they don't want this church to succeed. They don't want good things to happen here. They don't want to change. They don't want to get better. They just want to cause division, cause strife, cause problems. They want to change how the pastor is, what the pastor teaches, what the pastor does. It's very difficult when you're starting a church because that's usually the first group of people you get. They go, oh, this is a new work. I'm going to go there and I'm going to mold it how I think everything should be. Amen? Amen. But if we seek out the wrong sources for this, it's going to be a lot difficult for us. And in reality, the Bible through this psalm tells us that we have all the help we need through God. The scripture tonight is Psalms 121. We're going to be reading from verses 1 through 8. And what this psalm is, is they call it a psalm of decrees. And it was a song that the worshipers would sing on their way to all the Jewish festivals and all the Jewish feasts. Remember, there was no Uber back then. So for some of them, it would take a long time. It was a long journey of uh, two, three weeks, four weeks at a time to get to Jerusalem to partake of these big feasts and these big ceremonies for, for onto God. So on the way, they were pilgrims passing through foreign lands. And they would sing these songs, and this is one of the psalms that they would sing to remind them about the help. And, and as you read it, you're going to hear some of these uh, different uh, notes. Their songs today, the Song of Ascent is the song that we sing 
here at church, and it, it piggybacks off of this psalm. And it's talking about as we go through this life, as we know heaven is our home as Christians, we're living on this earth, we're trying to live right for God, and there's problems, there's trials, there's thieves, there's robbers that are trying to destroy, derail our lives, but we have to know where our help comes from. We have to believe, we have to go to the source of what, to the true help that's going to get us where we need to be. The right help tonight is what's going to continue to change your life. Psalms 121 verse 1 through 8, and then I'm going to pray. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Let's pray here. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you have your way in this place. Lord, I pray that you increase as I decrease, God, that you bring just a peace about our current situations here, Lord, as we trust in your word tonight that tells us the right kind of help comes from you here, Lord, in this place. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the church says amen and amen. Tonight, I want to first look at the source of our help. The writer here says, I look my eyes onto the mountains. From where does my help come from? So other translations might say hills. And what it's speaking to is as they were looking to where they're headed, which was Jerusalem, they could see the hills, they could see the mountains, and they would say, I know that all that I need and all that's going to be at the end of this journey is right through those hills. But that doesn't mean that help is distant from me. That doesn't mean that I'm out here all alone. And this is the first truth that we have to accept here tonight. Is that although we can see heaven and we know, man, at the end of this crazy life, I will be walking on streets of gold. I will have no more pain, no more hurt, no more tears coming from my eyes. That is where I will be. You must believe that that does not mean that you are helpless here today. They said, although I know where I'm going... Still, I have a source of help on this journey. And there's times in our lives where we might feel helpless. We might feel like nobody understands. We might feel like we're all alone. There's been times even in my own life that all these good things are happening around me. God is using me. But I can be in my spirit feeling like I'm just all discombobulated. Like, God, I don't know about this. I don't know about this future. I don't know if, I, if I'm going to be able to be the man that you've called me to be. I don't know. Those fears are always in my heart. It's a burden that I live with. And it's something that has followed me my entire life. You know, I've been saved eight years. It's the longest that I've ever done anything. Everything in my life I've quit. I've quit college. I've quit my relationships. Me and my wife have been divorced. I've quit being a father. I've quit jobs. I've quit more jobs than I can even count. I've moved numerous times. I've left this region two or three times, just took off on random things, went to another city, got tough over there, took off in the middle of the night. I've always ran my entire life. Being saved and being in Christ is the longest thing I've ever done. And sometimes the enemy attacks me in that realm. And he goes, you're not going to be here long. 
you're going to run again. Might be eight years, might be 10 years, might be 12, maybe 15, but you're not going to be doing this long. And I can get troubled in my spirit. And I have to believe this scripture. I say, man, God, I know I'm headed towards heaven, but you're here. You're my help here on this journey. I have to trust you. I have to believe in you. I have to know that you're there for me. That's how we keep walking forward. Despite the dangers, despite the unknown. You know, the unknown is, cripples a lot of us in life. I believe it's the animal, the impala. You know, the, the, the animal, the impala, can leap over 15 feet. It can jump 15 feet. That's almost half this room. But yet, they can keep the impala in little cages with a fence this high. Why? Because the impala will not jump where it can't see where it's going to land. It will not jump where it doesn't see where it's going to land. So although it has all this ability, 10 feet in the air, 15 feet far, it stays confined in a little cage because of fear of the unknown. And as we're traveling on this journey, we say, man, I have help today. I have help tomorrow. I have help in the future. The next 10 minutes, the next 10 years, if that's what the Lord gives me, I have help. I have someone who's going to be there for me. And my God is present with me. And then the writer goes to explain to us just who that help is. He says, my help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. I mean, what an amazing ally to have. You know, me and my kids, we play this Mario Party game. It's just a clean game. And, and in the game, you get allies that help you roll, that give you different dices. And I was thinking about that as I put this message together. What an amazing ally to have. You know, my son would say, OP, overpowered. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is your ally. And it's what the writer said. It's easy to forget. It's easy to forget. And he says, you don't have a nation behind you. You don't have an army behind you. You have God. The maker, the creator, who made heaven and earth. And if he can make this world, if he can make the heavens, if he can make the very enemy that's coming against your life, he made the devil... He made the demons who they are. He made your co-worker who can't stand your guts. He made your husband who won't get right. He made your wife who won't get right. He made those knucklehead kids who be cussing you out, acting a fool. If he can make all those things, I'm pretty sure he can help you through what you got going on. And we say, man, my God is a God that has power. When there was nothing... Just by his word, he made everything. And yet it doesn't stop there. That should be enough. But then he goes on in verse 3. He will not allow your foot to slip. I want to take just a brief moment to explain this. Because some people want to translate this and make this think that God says that means you're not going to sin. But in reality, it's not what God's talking about here. The King James Version, I believe, says uh, he will not allow your foot to be moved. And the reason why the translations differ is be, they, they say the same thing, but in a different way. So the writer here is telling us God is the one who does not allow our feet to slip. He doesn't allow our foot to be moved. So if we're standing upon God and we're standing in God's will... There's nothing that can just come and take you out of it. And we have to believe that because there's doctrines out there that believe the enemy can just come and snatch you. Can't happen. There's nothing that can just physically move you without you wanting to be moved. It says God's the one who's holding that for us. 
This is why Ephesians 6, 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You have to find your place in this life where you're going to choose to stand. And if that's not on God and what God has given us, then you're going to be in a place where you can be easily moved. You're going to be in a realm where you're easily shaken, easily blown to the side. But the biblical concept here is that God has a place for us that when we stand in that place, he is supernaturally keeping us from being knocked off. Oh, we might shake. <laughs> we might teeter. The winds blow. The wolf howls. But God says, I'm holding you firm because you chose me as your foundation. You didn't choose something from this world. And this is a mistake a lot of us make, and I make it too sometimes. When the earthquakes of life start to hit, you ever be just walking somewhere and the wind hits you? What do you force the first thing you do? You go to grab something to, to stabilize yourself. So when the winds of life hit, what's the first thing that you grab onto? Your wallet? Oh, let me make sure that I got money so I can get through this. Your spouse? Oh, as long as I got them, I'm good. Friends? What's the first thing that we grab? And this is what God is saying. If you always stay with me and grab to me, yeah, all those things have their purpose, but they're not the things that are going to keep your foot from slipping. He is. So you have to stand on a few things. You got to stand in grace sometimes. And say, hey, man, I messed up. I flipped out. <laughs> I lost control. But we can stand in condemnation. We can stand in our failures. We can stand in our nonsense. Or we can pick ourselves up, wipe the tears from our eyes, brush our shoulders off and say, God, forgive me. I flipped out and come and stand in God's grace. We need to stand in the gospel. We can stand in courage and in strength. We can stand in faith. We can stand in Christian liberty. We can stand in Christian unity. That's an idiot that a lot of people don't like. And we can stand in the Lord. God says, man, all these things, I, I've got foundations all over the place that you could say, this is what I'm going to anchor myself to through this season. And he says, I'm going to keep your foot from slipping. I'm going to keep your feet from being moved. But where are you standing? See, the right kind of help. Sounds great. We'll be like, man, amen, I don't want to fall no more. But where are you standing? Because that's a direct promise. That's like me telling you I have $100 for you, but it's not here, it's at my house. How long before, if I just keep saying I have $100 for you, you'll be like, hey, Pastor, we need to get to your house. Because the $100 ain't doing nothing for me right here in the church. We need to get over there, right? And that's what God is saying. I have the ability to keep you solid, standing firm, not wavering to and fro, not in church one day, in, not in church the next, not uncommitted, this and that, flipping and that, whatever the case may be. God says, I have stability, I have foundation, I have something that you can hold on to, and I'll keep you from slipping, but it's over here, and you're hanging out over there. You're over there blaming the devil. Man, the devil keeps knocking me around. You're on the wrong foundation. You better get over where, where he says he's going to keep you. Then he goes on to say, he who keeps you will not slumber. Oh, man, how some of us can be asleep. 
God says, I don't ever sleep. Never. It sounds goofy, not goofy, but it sounds trivial to think that, of course, God doesn't sleep, right? But he reminds his people, he who keeps you individually is not asleep at the wheel. Then he says, he who keeps Israel, he who keeps this very nation, he who keeps this very world in his hand is not asleep at the wheel. This is why I catch a lot of slack from Christians, because there's Christians on both sides of the aisle when you're talking about politics in America. The funny thing is, we're so consumed with politics here that the rest of the world could care less what's going on, right? But for us, it's life or death. Like, calm down. It's not that serious, all right? And God says, I'm the one keeping this whole nation in my hand. Nothing happens outside of my control, and I'm keeping you as well. And I'm not asleep. I'm watching. My eyes, I know what's taking place. Back in the days of World War II, the Germans were bombing, bombing London all night, every night. After one terrible attack, the people of London began to search through the rubble, looking for the dead and the injured. After a while, all had been accounted for but one old grandmother her name was mrs smith they searched everywhere for her and finally somebody found her in her bedroom asleep in her bed they were shocked and they asked her how could you sleep with all these bombs going off dropping all around her answer to which was the bible says that he who keeps israel never slumbers nor sleeps so i decided that there was no reason for both of us to be staying up so i went to sleep and left it in the lord's hand I like where that woman's head is at. Some of us are losing sleep over things in our lives. And God says, take your rest. I'm not asleep here. You can't do nothing about it, no way. No matter how much you worry, no matter how much you stress, no matter how many nights you go restless, you can't change it. And that lack of control leads us to do things that we shouldn't be doing. Leads us to abuse things like medication and alcohol and different things because they're trying to soothe the fact that we know that this situation is completely outside of our control. We try to remedy that. Some of us, it's not with alcohol, it's not with drugs, it's with power, it's with position, it's with treating people bad, it's, it's just different things, and it's all because we're afraid, because we realize that we have no control over the situation, so we're trying to grasp every little bit of control that we have. God says, I'm not asleep. You can rest. Go ahead, go to bed. Don't let this stuff keep you up. I had to learn to do this too. You think it's hard just carrying your burdens. Try being a pastor. And this is a small church. 21 people. I'm thinking about 21 people's issues all day long. Man, God, this person's family member is sick. This person's family member is in hospice. This person's got this issue at work. This person's over here doing this. This person I haven't seen in six months. This person just called me, but then they didn't come. It's all day. Sometimes at night, your spirit is troubled for people. And I have to go to where my help comes from. And say, God, you're not asleep. These are your people. Help me, Lord, to get some rest here tonight. Help me, Lord, with the things that I can't control. Help me, God, to be at peace, Lord. I got to go to the right help. Verse 5, God's help brings us protection. So now we know where the help is coming from. Now let's see a few more things that help us. Says the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. I got to move quickly. I didn't want to keep you here too long, but man, I'm just 
I'm just enjoying this message, amen. I'm preaching to myself in this place. This verse is telling us that God's going to protect us from our enemies, specifically our weaknesses and blind spots in our lives. This phrase, the Lord is a shade upon your right hand, it's talking about a warrior fighting. Because in those times, a warrior would have a shield in the left hand and a sword in the right hand. That was the most common way to fight. So their natural weakness, their natural blind spot was the right side of their body. Because they couldn't both hold a shield and a sword. So God's saying, I am the shade on your right hand. So when you're in this fight and you look vulnerable because you're swinging, man, I got no protection. God says, I'm there. He's in our blind side. He sees what we don't see. He sees the enemy and his conniving attacks because we're always worried about the attack that's coming dead on at us. And a lot of times the enemy's working in a covert operations. Sometimes the enemy's got spies in the land. Special forces coming in the darkness. We don't even see it coming. God says, I wasn't fooled. That's why we have the spirit of discernment. That's why out of nowhere we'll be sitting there and be like, man, I got to check this. I've been feeling weird today. That's God checking your blind spot. That little voice is not an angel sitting on your shoulder and the devil arguing. It's God telling you, hey, stay away from that fool. Stay away from that girl. That's God watching your blind spot. He says, I see it. You don't. He's protecting us that way. There's a tax to our weaknesses that the enemy knows about. And it's not to say that that you're going to be perfect. It's just to tell you that, listen, God knows this about us. Elijah, a man who called fire down from heaven, ran hundreds of miles away just by a word that Jezebel said she was going to kill him. Moses was known for his kindness and his reserved attitude, yet he missed out on the promised land, losing his temper and smiting a rock. Abraham's greatest strength, they call him the father of faith, yet he goes to Egypt with pure unbelief and tells Pharaoh that his wife is his sister. These are heroes of our faith that had great weaknesses, great blind spots. God says, I protected them too. And he can protect you. You don't got to act like you're perfect. You don't got to pretend like you got it all figured out. Hey, I got news for you. You're looking for a pastor that knows everything. You're in the wrong church. I don't got it all figured out. I'm man enough to admit it. I got major blind spots in my life. But God's watching them for me. He's helping me. And little by little, I get rid of some of them. New one might approach. (laughs) And then I got to fight again. But God says, man, I see the whole picture. And it's something that you got to believe. We're we're so worried about everything that the devil's doing. God says, man, I got you. I got what you see. I got what you don't see. Again, where are you standing, though? See, I'm standing in the will of God. So I know that these promises are mine. I don't got to name it. I don't got to claim it. I don't got to blab it. I ain't got to grab it. I just got to believe it. I'm in the will of God. So I believe what his word says. I don't even got to waste a breath on the devil. Don't got time for it. I don't got time to be standing and being around just goofiness. You know, there's a a wedding and one of my family members, I don't care what they say, they could be watching, I could care less. I get invited to a wedding from somebody I haven't talked to in four years. Out of the blue. Here's the funny thing. 
The invitation didn't even come to me direct. Came through a third party. Hey, so and so said you're invited. <laughs> then I find out there's some people there that can't stand the church. Got issues with lighthouse. Used to come, don't come no more. Got issues, and I was gonna go. And I mean, you know what, Lord? I don't got time to be around there. One of them wrote me on the internet. Said, hey, I didn't see you at the wedding. How come you weren't there? I said, Jesus taught me don't cast my pearls amongst the swine. <laughs> didn't write me back no more. That's what Jesus, I'm in the will of God. I ain't got time for y'all nonsense. What am I going to do? Go there. You know what happened? Reports came back that other people from the church went there, started feeling some type of way because somebody was running their mouth. Why do I got to be around that? No, I'm standing over here. Clean release, man. You're going one way, I'm going another. It's all good. Hope I see you there when I get there. But it takes that sometimes. And we want to be standing on unsolid foundation, standing around with a bunch of goofy people, and then we wonder why we're easily knocked over time and time again. Make a tough decision. Make a stand for your life and say, I'm not standing with you fools no more. I'm going to stand with God and that's it. Do your thing. He protects us from elements. When he talks about that the sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night, this might seem like a very basic concept, but when I started to study this, I was like, whoa, God. So the sun is referring to physical attacks on our body. One of the main things that used to attack uh, armies and could destroy your army even before they fought one battle was the heat of the sun. There's a lot of parts of Israel that are desert land, a lot of parts of Egypt. So as these armies will have to travel through, there is a very real capability of heat stroke and sunstroke killing guys, destroying warrior, warriors, taking their lives out, an attack on the body. So God's word is telling you here, hey, although they might come, it ain't going to destroy you. Physical attacks come. I had an attack today. Hip is killing me. Came to church, didn't have any pain medicine, could barely walk, started preaching, pain's gone. Because it's not going to smite me. Oh, am I hurt for a season? I might have to deal with this for the rest of my life, but it ain't going to take me out. It's not going to make me quit. And physical sickness and disease knocks a lot of Christians out. Because they stay on the foundation of why God, why me, why cancer, why this disease, why this sickness. They stay on that foundation instead of saying, God, I might be sick, I might be hurting, but it's not going to take me out. And then he talks about the moon. Oh, we're going to talk about it tonight. He says the moon by night. You know, there was something in ancient times called moonstroke. It's where we get the word lunatic from. Luna being the root word of lunar, meaning moon. And they believed that the nights away from home away from the family for months and years at end would drive guys crazy in their mind. So God says, not only the physical attacks am I going to keep you from, but the crazy mind battles that you're going through. Amen. The moon ain't going to knock you out. The mind battles that we, we fight, you know, the, 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 the devil's name it means diablos in the Greek. That's the word for devil. Dia means to throw something at a wall just uh, until it completely penetrates it. And balos, the second part of that word, diablos, is talking about a ball or an object. When that scripture in Ephesians says schemes, it's talking about one road that the enemy takes. His favorite mode of attack is right here. And he'll attack day and night. Boom, 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 boom. Until he'll completely penetrate you. And God said, if you're standing on my foundation, 
the moonstroke ain't going to knock you out. You'll be able to keep your mind right. You'll be able to think right. See, some of us, our mind is running wild because we're standing in the wrong place. Man, God, I don't know why I just can't stop thinking like this. God's like, look down. You're standing in the wrong place. Man, God, why is my mind running wild? Why am I thinking about sleeping with people? Oh, don't act like you don't be thinking about dropping them draws. God, why am I thinking like this? Why am I thinking evil against my brothers and my sisters in Christ? I want to love them, Lord, but then when I see them, I just can't stand them. Why am I thinking like that, God? God says, you're standing in the wrong place. So the devil's just right up here. Until he penetrates. Until his lies become your new truth. You know what they say about assumptions? I can't repeat it behind this pulpit. You want to know something crazy? The enemy's lies has become some of our new truths. The enemy's told you your family's never going to get saved. That's become your new truth. You believe it. You might even start saying it now to people. Oh, my kids, man, I don't know about them, man. I know God can save, but, man, my children, they're just, they might be a little too far gone. Oh, the devil's lies have become your new truth. Oh, I can never do nothing for God. I can never be used by God. Look at me. I'm just a screw up. I'm just this, I'm just that. Oh, the moonstroke is trying to take you out, friend of mine. And you got to get back on the solid foundation and say, God, protect my mind. God, cleanse my mind. God, free my mind from bondage. I don't want to believe these lies anymore. It's not true. Going crazy. And God says, I can protect you from it. But where are you standing? He ends with a tremendous promise as I'll end this message. Verse 7 and 8. The Lord. Say it again. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in. Only for a week, only for a day, only for a minute, from this time forth and forever. That's the help that God offers. God says, when you're standing with me, oh, everywhere you go, I'm with you. You're going out and you're coming in. Every second, every minute, every millisecond, God says, my hand's with you, child. Don't even fret. This is the truth that rejuvenates you. This is the truth that leads to other scriptures that say, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. See, because when you trust God and you know that God's with you, what you're going in and you're coming out then you can wait on God faithfully. And all his other promises start to come to you because you're on the right foundation. You're seeking the right help. You say, man, God, you're with me. Every step. And when you're walking like that, there's not much that can bother you. There's not much that can shake you. I've had people call me all kinds of things. It doesn't even shake me anymore. I had a guy at work, some random dude, never met him before. I'm, I'm dumping my load in my truck, and it's having a hard time coming out. He comes up talking stupid. Man, you guys don't know what you're doing. You, don't, you guys don't know how to drive. Your truck is trash. Taking pictures, videotaping me. I just pushed on about my day. 
One of my other co-workers gets into it with this guy, and he's, I mean, he's furious. And the Lord showed me, man, son, look at what I've done for you. You know, at one point in my life, I would have lost my job right there because I would have grabbed that guy by the throat, and me and him would have had a good time. Doesn't even bother me no more. Whatever, he wants to be an idiot, let him be an idiot. Stop letting those things bother you. You got to get on the right foundation. You know, the world's crazy. It's going to get crazier. I tell them what they are. I don't got time to argue with you. I had somebody say, I don't believe in God. I said, well, then you're an idiot. <laughs> wow, that's not very loving. That's what God said. He said, only a fool says in his heart there is no God. Right. How can you look at all this stuff around us and tell me it came from nothing? Man, you're an idiot. You can't, even, you can't even base that logically. There's not one thing in this world that is created that you can look at and say, man, that just came from nothing. So I ain't got time to argue with you. That's like trying to argue with a crackhead. I ain't got time to argue with you. It's unlogical. That's what God is saying. Only a fool can look at creation and say there's no creator. So why are you wasting your time arguing with idiots? Peace. I'm on the right foundation. I don't got time for the garbage no more. Because you know all that it is, is the enemy trying to drain your life. Trying to put burdens and responsibility on you that's not even yours. Even with spreading the gospel, please, in your evangelism, read the word of God. Read the parable of the sower. At what point was it the sower's job to get the seed in the right ground? Never. Just spread. Hey, man, Jesus loves you, man. You got a moment I can tell you what Jesus done for me? No? Blank you. Okay, no problem. On to the next. Out of my mind. If somebody else opens up to me, yeah, what's, what's going on? Man, Jesus changed my life, man. Set me free from drugs and alcohol. I could do the same for you, man. If that's your problem, whatever your problem is, God can help you, man. The world's coming to an end soon. You need Jesus. That's what the gospel says. My job is done. We're not here tallying how many people we get saved. We're not here doing that. God says it's not even your responsibility. Just spread my word. God doesn't need you to defend the Bible. Doesn't need you to do that. He's been doing it for thousands of years without you. I'm pretty sure he's going to be all right. You got a Bible today, don't you? The Bible's still the number one world seller book, still to this day. Hundreds of languages, hundreds of apps. I mean, more, more access to God's word than there's ever been in this world. God don't need our help. He says, no, I'm here to help you. You got to get on the right foundation. Say, God, all these things that are not my responsibility, I don't want to be worried about that stuff no more.